Um, I'm conscious that today there are many people in the room who have participated in the earlier consultations on the development of the affordable housing framework. That contribution has greatly assisted in shaping the tools and the guidance materials that have so far crafted, have been crafted to implement the framework. It's been great to have so much positive engagement and support from a diverse range of cont contributors. Um, so thank you for your support in getting us to this stage and, and for your ongoing interest in making a success of the new voluntary agreement tool. We see today as part of the ongoing engagement that we will have with you as stakeholders. And this morning provides an opportunity to, for us to recap on the elements of the new framework. More importantly, it's a chance to explore innovations in affordable housing, and that will be our focus after morning tea. OK, so changes to the Planning and Environment Act. So the recent amendments to the Act introduce new provisions that provide a framework for the delivery of affordable housing through voluntary agreements. So those agreements are still voluntary. Um, and those agreements are made under Section 173 of the Planning and Environment Act. So the first change embeds the facilitation of affordable housing as an objective of the Act. So why is this important? For the first time, the Act recognises the role of the planning system in contributing towards affordable housing outcomes. It supports the inclusion of affordable housing policies or provisions in planning schemes, which in turn will support the inclusion of affordable housing requirements in permits granted and the conditions that may be imposed on those permits. The voluntary nature of the framework allows for scope for innovation and affordable housing solutions to meet the needs of communities. It provides the base, basis for discussion between the responsible authority, generally councils, and the landowner, developers, on what might be required as an affordable housing component within a new development. It recognises that there is no one size fits all when it comes to considering the needs of a community and provides the enabling environment for parties to any agreement to identify solutions that can be targeted to a community's needs. A further change is to affirm the use of Section 173 agreements to deliver affordable housing. The use of those agreements is not new. However, the explicit reference to their use in the context of affordable housing provides greater certainty of the appropriateness of its use of this tool for the purpose of affordable housing. It also provides a mechanism within which to collaborate in the delivery of affordable housing solutions. As part of the guidance that's been provided to date, we have included an example section 173 agreement. We've called it an affordable housing agreement that includes optional clauses that may be used in particular solutions to deliver affordable housing outcomes. These are only example clauses, um, but they point to the type of arrangements that may eventuate and may be put, made possible through the use of the agreement. One thing I would stress is that um, to, to differentiate between a 173 agreement and those used for the purpose of delivering affordable housing, um, would be to identify the agreements um, by that term so that it will enable us to monitor what is happening out there and see whether or not we're actually getting a good um, flow through of um, initiatives as a result of the, the new framework. The second amendment introduced a definition of affordable housing that places the emphasis on the recipient of the affordable housing, that is very low, low and moderate income households, rather than defining the characteristics of a product or products. This has the effect of providing certainty around who is eligible for assistance rather than linking the term affordable housing with a specific product or a particular price point. The Act specifies that the household income ranges of very low, low and moderate income households may be set by an order in Council. 
Um, and this is also gives the effect of um, providing certainty around who is eligible for assistance around any given time. Now, we've actually provided you with a copy of um, the Order in Council um, in the, the uh, part, pack that you received this morning. Um, so you'll be able to see, I don't, don't know how legible that is from the back of the room, but um, essentially the, the, the um, income ranges go from you know, up to 52,940. Um, household income for a family on a very low income range to um, 127,000 for a moderate income range for a fan family. So this will enable us to capture some of those um, households that, that Ben mentioned earlier, um, including key workers who uh, require affordable housing. The definition also includes social housing. Um, and social housing is defined as having the same meaning as within section 4.1 of the Housing Act. Um, and for those who are not familiar with that, this definition includes public housing and uh, housing that is owned, managed, or controlled by registered housing agencies. So when we use these terms, um, what do we mean and how are the income levels calculated? Um, well, the Act requires us to use certain um, data um, to um, base the uh, methodology for defining the income levels. Um, we use statistical da data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics from the 2016 Census of Population and Housing Median Weekly Income Household. And while I'm not, I don't intend going into the actual technical methodology today, this can be found on our uh, website, um, I do want to make a few points that expand the information that's contained within the order. So firstly, the definitions um, for very low, low and moderate income households is set at 50, 80 and 120% of gross medium income, uh, household income for Greater Melbourne or for the rest of the state, depending on the geographic location of the household. So if there was such a thing as a, a national approach to how you would set those levels, this was pretty much consistent with that. Um, it is uh, a methodology that's used in other jurisdictions. Um, secondly, income ranges will be reviewed on an annual basis um, in February um, of each year, uh, and if required, a revised income income ranges will be released in, the, in March. So this will ensure currency of the income levels and allow for consideration of any emerging factors that may be relevant. So for the purpose of determining what's appropriate for the housing needs of very low income households, low income and moderate income households, legislative amendments allow for a range of matters to be specified by the minister by notice published in the government gazette. And again, you should have a copy of the um, government gazette notice in your handout. So I know it's a bit difficult to read on the screen there, but. The notice includes matters that must be considered when determining what is appropriate to the housing needs of eligible households. We provided some guidance on the planning website to further explore what might need to be taken into account when considering these matters. It must be stressed that these are elements that should form part of the conversation between responsible authorities and developers when considering what outcome, outcomes they wish to achieve. There's no explicit right answer to these matters, but parties to any negotiated agreement will need to determine how the matters are to be addressed, and particularly around how that fits with the needs of the, the broader community. The matters outlined in the notice include whether the housing is affordable for the eligible household income ranges, the appropriateness of the type of housing, such as, for example, number of bedrooms, proximity to services, um, proximity to transport, employment opportunities, um, 
and the length of time that the public benefit will be retained.